Uh, hello and uh, welcome for the uh, third lecture uh, on jet physics. Uh, today we will finally uh, introduce a proper definition of what we mean by jets uh, with so-called jet algorithms. Uh, so up to now I've been uh, rather vague on the precise definitions and uh, we instead uh, laid down more the foundations uh, uh, based on like QCD properties that uh, we will be using uh, now in this lecture to, uh, to understand these jet algorithms uh, in more detail. Now, in an ideal world, you would probably want to do a lot of measurements and comparisons using uh, various jet algorithms and, and settings. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, this is more challenging. Uh, given that on the experimental side, for instance, you would have to recalibrate your measurement each time you would set, uh, change these settings, which is a substantial effort. Um, and similarly, on the theory side, uh, making these position predictions also a lot of effort. So as such, it's quite important that there is uh, some uh, level of community-wide agreement as to what kind of standard jet uh, definitions should be used. Uh, here you see a little screenshot of uh, a snow mass report from 1990, uh, where they tried to um, give some uh, recommendations. Uh, and in that document, they also list uh, the kind of properties uh, that you would like to have uh, for, for a jet definition. Uh, I highlighted two of them. Uh, the yellow one uh, is concerned more with the theory um, property. Uh, which we discussed last time um, about the uh, infrared safety, uh, which would allow us uh, to apply perturbation theory without uh, our answers being infinite. Um, on the experimental side, um, the dimensions simple to implement. Uh, mainly the challenge here is the performance. Uh, so you would you get a very high rate of events that you would like to analyze. Uh, so, and uh, at the detector level, you have hundreds of particles. Uh, so these uh, algorithms better be efficient uh, for them to be useful uh, in practice. Uh, I will uh, probably comment a little bit on this uh, later. Uh, so as I've already mentioned a couple of times, one can think of these jet definitions uh, as a projection, uh, as an input to you have the momenta of the particles, or just the four momenta, or calorimetric powers, uh, depending on at which stage you want to apply it. Uh, and as an output, you want to get a set uh, of reconstructed jets. Uh, let me just give a very brief and uh, certainly very incomplete history of, of jets. Uh, so to my knowledge, the very first jet definition uh, is the so-called Stern and Weinberg jet, uh, uh, proposed in 1977. Uh, which allows you to identify two jet events in the plus and minus two uh, hadrons, uh, which in a way is a cone-like definition. Uh, then uh, later on in the plus and minus uh, collision, you yes, have uh, things like the jade algorithm, uh, and then later on the KT algorithm uh, had been proposed, which is also known as the Durham algorithm. Uh, I believe it was in the workshop in Durham that this, this algorithm was conceived or proposed. Um, which has been the workhorse at, at lab colliders. Um, and uh, shortly after, well, uh, a little bit after, so the Cambridge Aachen algorithm, which is entirely geometric um, uh, picture on, on a jet. Uh, and um, a real game changer in the business was the proposal of the so called anti KT algorithm in 2008. Uh, so up to this point, these, uh, these kinds of theoretically good uh, jet algorithms like the KT and the Cambridge Aachen uh, have not been adopted for the hadron colliders. Uh, so the, the Tevatron jet measurements are largely, uh, well, actually entirely based on more cone type uh, algorithms, uh, which turn out to have issues with infrared sensitivity, uh, which I will uh, touch on in a moment. And it was really this anti-KT algorithm that, that finally um, resolved the, the problems on the experimental side that they could actually be adopted uh, on the experiment. So uh, these days, every single jet measurement is basically uh, done using anti-KT. Uh, so I already uh, dropped a couple of uh, terms. Uh, 
before explaining them. Um, so there are essentially two main classes of chat uh, algorithms. Uh, one is a, is a cone type algorithm. The picture is, is more top-down approach. Uh, so the idea is you, you look at the direction of energy flow and you try to identify coarse regions of, uh, of, of energy deposits. Right, so this is what we have been doing uh, in our head uh, when we looked at events and we drew cones on top of them. Right, we identified like coarse regions where the energy flow was going. Uh, so this is probably the more intuitive way of thinking about jets. And the other way is uh, uh, the one using sequential recombinations, which is more a bottom-up approach. Uh, and here the idea is that you try to successively like undo the branching of QCD uh, emissions. Uh, and uh, so basically you, you have to uh, first identify which particles are close and then aggre uh, aggre uh, aggregate them uh, uh, successively. But I will discuss this in a little bit more. Uh, as I already mentioned briefly, uh, these cone algorithms have uh, an issue with uh, infrared uh, safety. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, all cone algorithms are uh, basically infrared uh, unsafe uh, with the exception of one, uh, which is the, so the only infrared safe one, as far as I know, uh, is the so-called uh, Cisco uh, algorithm. Um, and all others are uh, plagued by the issue of infrared uh, unsafety. Uh, so all LHC measurements uh, or recent uh, JET uh, definitions are all entirely based on the sequential combination algorithms. Uh, so let me just briefly try to highlight what are the potential issues you have uh, when we use cones, in particular seeded cones. Um, so here are two configurations where, where problems can arise. Um, so one, idea you might have uh, is to say, okay, I have uh, cones of a fixed radius, right? Uh, so these guys have a certain radius. And my task is to place these uh, cones into my event uh, to, to identify, identify my jets. Uh, so the first idea you might have, which is probably also what you would do intuitively in your head when you look at events is to say, I'll place the cones around uh, the particle that has the highest energy because that's that's where you see the peak. So uh, roughly, you assume uh, that that's the core of the hard part on that initiated it. So it seems very intuitive to place a cone around it uh, and then collect up the extra radiation around it. Uh, so that would be um, one way of looking at it. Um, and what what can go wrong uh, in this in this picture? Um, what can go wrong is if if this the definition of what I call um, the hardest uh, particle in the event is not infrared uh, a collinear safe. Uh, so imagine this this hard particle. Uh, splits into two uh, other ones, right? That are collinear. Uh, because collinear safety told me that the answer should not depend uh, whether um, I, I have one particle or I split this particle up into two collinear particles. So this is what I've done. But now the hardest uh, or the most high energetic particle I have is actually the one on the left hand side. So the cone that I would draw would go around this one. So it would capture these two, but you see that uh, now I lost uh, uh, one hit or one, one particle that I would have uh, in the other case uh, included into my jet definition. Right? So the answer has changed uh, under a collinear split, and therefore uh, this, this approach is not uh, collinear safe. Uh, so then you might ask, okay, if the problem is with uh, placing it around the hardest, uh, why, sh 
why shouldn't I just go on and, and place it around all uh, particles and then pick out the one that after summing up the, the constituents is the hardest, right? Uh, so I'll try all particles at C, uh, as seeds, and then I pick out the, the cone with the largest um, energy. Unfortunately, this also uh, has a problem. Uh, and the problem this time is with uh, soft safety. So if I have this, these two particles at a distance that is far enough that they, um, that they are not, uh, that they cannot be clustered uh, with each other directly, right? Uh, so they would go into two different jets uh, as it is. Uh, but now imagine I, I place a soft particle uh, in between them. Uh, now, since the algorithm is that I will place cones around all particles, I will also uh, generate the case where I will place a cone around the soft one as a seed. Uh, and now I actually will combine these two, two orange uh, particles together into one single jet, which uh, as the sum will have a higher energy than the individual ones on the left hand side. Uh, so I would actually pick out the one on the right hand side to be the, the hardest jet. Uh, so again, I have the issue that um, my, my outcome uh, depends on the placement of soft particles into my event. And therefore, uh, this is not uh, soft safe. So the core issue here is that, uh, that I have to uh, place seeds, right? It's, it's the choice of the seeds for my cones that, that is, is causing the trouble. Uh, in principle, you could go ahead and say, I will just try all possible combinations of particles, uh, and then I see whether they give rise to stable cones. Uh, now, and that would be an infrared safe way uh, of defining a jet. Uh, so why, why don't we do that? Now, if I try out all combinations of, uh, uh, of assigning particles into a, a, a jet, uh, this is a two to the n scaling that I have, right? And I will have to repeat it order of n times in order to identify order of n jets. So the scaling goes like order of n times two to the n. Now, if I have 100 particles in my event, uh, 100 particles, this gives rise to 10 to the 32 operations, right, in a way. Now, let's say I, I have some computers uh, which can, what is this, uh, have like 10 to the 9 a gigahertz of, uh, uh, of operations uh, per, per second. Uh, let's just pretend uh, that in this clustering, each operation can be done in one clock cycle, right? So this is divided by 10 to the 9. Uh, so this still gives rise to 10 to the 23 seconds uh, uh, in order to process an event with 100 particles. Uh, and it turns out this is already larger than the age of the universe. So clearly, this is not the kind of resource you have to, to process events. And this is why, um, why this is a very challenging thing, why you had to try to invent the shortcut going through the seeded procedures in order to, to make it uh, feasible in practice. Right? Uh, so now the scaling is, a, is the most naive way of doing it. Uh, and you can certainly improve this much more. And in the Cisco, which is also a seedless uh, uh, cone algorithm, they, they, they actually can do this in n squared log n time, uh, which is manageable. Okay, so now that I uh, discussed uh, cone uh, algorithms uh, and their issues, uh, let me move on to the sequential recombination algorithms. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the cones, given that they are these days no longer uh, really in use. So in the, um, right, so this is my transition. I think I mentioned everything that I wanted to say. Yeah. So
So let me move on to sequential recombination algorithms. Uh, so here, what we want to do, as I said before, is we try to work our way backwards in the branching. Right? Uh, so if I had this, this picture of this quark that subsequently emits gluons uh, and so forth, uh, I want to go backwards and try to uh, get back to this initiating uh, quark. So the algorithm is quite simple. I have to find a definition of what I mean by close, right? Uh, so, and there are two types of distances. Uh, there's a distance between two particles in the final state, dij. Uh, and then uh, in the case of hydrogen colliders, I also have to introduce something like a distance measure with respect to the B, so DIB. Um, and then in the second step, we find the smallest of, of these distance measures. If the smallest is a DIJ, it means the, the closest, uh, I found the closest two pairs of particles in the final state. Uh, so the procedure is to uh, merge these particles together uh, into one uh, so-called protojet. Uh, and in the so-called E scheme, uh, where I frankly don't know why it's called the E scheme, uh, you, you would uh, just sum up the form momentum of the two uh, to uh, assign the form momentum to the merged jet. Um, if the smallest distance turns out to be DIB, you would remove it from the set of particles and call it a jet. Uh, and then after this, uh, either you merged or either, either you removed a particle as a jet, so you decreased the number of particles on the investigation. Uh, if there are still particles less, go back to step one and repeat uh, and do this until uh, you've labeled all, partic uh, all objects as jet, right? Uh, and then you're done. So obviously the main question is then what are the appropriate distance measures uh, to pick? Now, there are a couple of things you might uh, consider uh, suitable. So one uh, thing that obviously comes to mind uh, is to, to look at the uh, emission. So we saw that uh, if I have this particle that splits into two, I and J, uh, the thing that kind of generates this, this uh, diversion behavior was this propagator, right? Uh, which went like one over pi plus pj squared. So why not just take sij, the invariant uh, between part or particle i and j as a distance measure? Uh, so this is a very uh, intuitive uh, thing, I think, from a theory perspective to choose. Uh, Unfortunately, and it was also something that was uh, done in case of B plus and minus, this was the Jade algorithm. Uh, but unfortunately, it turns out this is a very bad choice. Uh, so uh, this is actually not something uh, that is in use. Uh, uh, what uh, else can I think of? Well, I know what is the radiation pattern, right? Uh, so I had this DE. Uh, over E, let me just write E here, and D theta over theta. Um, if I have two particles, the, the one that is causing the E is the one with the small energy. So let's just write the minimum of E i or E j, right? And why not just take the, the bottom, the denominator uh, of this expression as a distance measure? Right. In a way, it's the inverse of the radiation pattern uh, that we've derived um, uh, before uh, that would then basically kind of undo this, this branching. And indeed, this is uh, what has been done, and that uh, goes under the name of the KT algorithm. Uh, and the reason it's called the KT is that it turns out this is uh, something like the a relative transverse momentum with respect to, to the harder uh, uh, part on I or J. Um, so that's why it's called the KT algorithm. Uh, so um, in the case of the hadron collider environment, instead of energies, we use transverse momenta, uh, as, as shown here. And uh, instead of uh, angles, we use uh, delta R. 
And uh, in addition, you introduce a new parameter, a capital R, which is which acts like a like a, a cone resolution parameter for your jet definition. So this is something you will uh, set yourself. Uh, and as I said already before, this uh, this kind of mimics the inverse of the uh, softening collinear emission probability. Now, what you can ask yourself is: Is this uh, an infrared safe? Uh, all right, and in, in the case of the BT beam, it's just the transverse momentum. Um, and uh, you can ask yourself, is this an infrared safe uh, procedure? Uh, so let's first think about the uh, collinear safety. Uh, in the case where particle i and j become collinear, uh, their delta r distance becomes zero. So uh, in that limit, it's guaranteed that dij will become the smallest. Uh, and then in the next step, it will be uh, recombined and merged into one single uh, object. So this precisely does uh, undo does the, the collinear splitting, which is what we want. Uh, so that's very good. Um, what about soft safety? In the case of soft safety, uh, the minimum will pick out the, the energy of my soft particle. Uh, similarly, however, also for the uh, beam distance measurement uh, measure. And uh, here uh, you can imagine uh, the case that I have already uh, hard particles with some cones and I emit something soft in between them, which is outside of the R distance, right? Uh, and then in this uh, configuration, you will see given that the, this emission, this soft emission is outside of the cone, delta R to the other particles is always larger than R, right? So this is larger than one. Uh, so for the soft particle, it's always going to be the DID that is going to be selected. Now, what is the problem with that? Uh, if it's DID, I will remove it from the set and I will call the jet. Uh, so in the next step, I would call this soft guy uh, a new jet. So as it stands, the number of jets uh, is actually not infrared safe. So one thing that is still missing here uh, is a fourth step where you say only keep, keep the jets that have a certain transverse momentum above the PT cut. So there's a second parameter in this algorithm, which uh, in a way regulates the the soft uh, object that I identified as jet in the algorithms uh, in the steps above. Right? Uh, so this is because it's an inclusive uh, KT algorithm uh, where I basically cluster until uh, nothing is left over. And so this is the last condition that was still missing to only retain jets that, that are above a certain pressure value for the transverse momentum. Uh, very good. Uh, with this, however, everything's fine. Uh, now, uh, one uh, property of this KT algorithm uh, is that uh, it will try to cluster uh, low energetic particles, so soft particles first, right? because in this distance measure, we always pick out the transverse momentum of the soft of the two, uh, meaning you always prioritize somehow the soft uh, emissions first, uh, and then you, you work your way backwards. Now, what this causes is that it gives you irregular shapes for the cluster jets. And this is a feature that is not uh, nice to have from the experimental uh, perspective, uh, because uh, things like jet calibration uh, for those kinds of objects, you would like to have a well-defined uh, region uh, that, that contributes to a jet. Uh, uh, whereas if you have some very irregular shapes that can uh, even spread out to, to larger angles, uh, then doing these calibrations is a much more challenging task. Uh, and also, given that you prioritize soft emission first, uh, you also will see that, that this algorithm actually collects quite a lot of junk. Uh, and with junk, I mean in the Hadron Collider environment, uh, like underlying event, pile up, uh, ISR things that you actually want to get rid of. Uh, those are typically soft uh, things in the event, uh, and then you start to collect these things up into your jet. Uh, so these are the reasons why 
uh, KT was, uh, was not uh, adapted at the hydrogen colliders. Whereas at uh, lab, the Durham algorithm is very nice because uh, you don't have any initial state hadrons, so you don't have things like MPI and, and underlying uh, and, and ISR and things like this. So you have a much cleaner environment where KT works beautifully. In a hadron collider, it has, it has quite some uh, downsides, which is why it has never been adapted. Now, um, how, how can you change this? Uh, so one uh, thing that, that you can change uh, is, to, is to play around with the distance measure and how it depends on the transverse momentum. Right? Um, if soft first is a problem, uh, why don't I play with the exponents here and, and see whether I can uh, get a property that is more uh, suitable for the hydrogen collide environments. And this is precisely what led uh, to the class of the generalized KT algorithm. Uh, so essentially, you introduce these additional uh, exponents or powers, uh, alpha denoted here. Uh, if you choose alpha equals one, it just gives me the standard KT algorithm. Uh, for alpha equals zero, you actually remove completely the PT dependence. Uh, so you entirely base your clustering on the angular uh, separation of particles. So it's a completely geometric picture uh, clustering. And uh, it's actually remarkable that it took so long to come up with this idea. Uh, once you see it, it's right in your face. Uh, you could also use a negative uh, exponent. And that's, that's the anti KT algorithm. And uh, by doing so, you actually prioritize clustering with respect to the hardest part of the first. Uh, and uh, what this then uh, results into is that you get nearly perfect cones out of the sequential combination algorithm. Uh, so uh, the, the picture is that uh, you have some very hard emission uh, and the and that kind of is picked out by this minimum function because it's one over pt squared. Uh, uh, so it picks out the one with the harder, uh, the hardest uh, uh, emission or hardest, uh, uh, largest energy. Uh, and then it kind of works uh, outwards from this uh, hard particle and it collects up all the emissions uh, until it reaches uh, the cone size R. Once it reaches the cone size R, the emissions that are happening outside of this cone have a delta R larger than R. So again, this, this ratio becomes larger than one. And uh, uh, for those emissions, it's actually the DID that, that is uh, large, uh, smaller. And thus, uh, it will not be clustered into the, this hard check. Um, now, uh, before I uh, move on to the comparison, let me briefly comment on the, uh, on the rough scaling of, of these algorithms. Uh, so the very naive scaling uh, of these generalized KT algorithms is uh, O to the M cubed, right? I, I have to compute N, N squared distances, uh, Dij, uh, and then I have to loop or iterate uh, n times, uh, order of n times uh, to, to uh, deplete the, the set of particles that are left over. Um, and this was another uh, issue with the KT algorithm, uh, or in general with this general KT algorithm, that this, this was uh, still a too high scale in order to be applicable. Um, and this has been also solved uh, around this time when also anti KT was proposed. Uh, where more sophisticated algorithms were used. And this could actually be pushed down uh, to n log n scaling, although this is a, a amortized n log n. So on average, uh, it goes uh, n log n for KT and the Cambridge Arpen. In the case of uh, anti-KT, the scaling is more like n to the power of uh, three halves, uh, still um, absolutely fine scaling uh, with performance that are uh, uh, good for, for applications in practice. Um, okay, so let's 
try to compare how these different uh, settings work and uh, actually see this irregular shapes that I was talking about. Uh, so this is illustrated here. Uh, we have the standard KT algorithm here. We have the Cambridge Aachen. So this is alpha equals zero. I should denote this. So this is alpha equals one. It's alpha equals zero. And this is the anti-KT. So this is alpha equals minus one. Uh, the cis cone is the, is the infrared safe cone algorithm, which I will not uh, touch on here. But what you immediately notice is that for the top two cases, uh, the shape of the, the boundaries of the jets that are identified, which are colored in different colors, uh, are very uh, irregular, right? Uh, and this is because uh, in the case of uh, KT in particular, you collect uh, soft junk uh, until you uh, cluster it down to the to the hard particles. Um, and the, the reason why these irregularities arise is because of a, a nonlinear behavior that you have with respect to soft emissions. So if you're interested in knowing more about this, feel free to ask this in the discussions. Uh, and the uh, anti-KT algorithm uh, neatly solves this issue by just uh, swapping the the exponent to a negative one. Uh, and you nicely see that, uh, that the clustering happens around these very hard uh, or high energetic uh, hits. And then it works backwards uh, to larger angles to, to basically soak up the emission up there, up to a point when it hits the, the cone size R. Uh, you also see that if two cones overlap, I mean, you cannot uh, uh, plaster a whole surface just with circles. There will be overlaps. Uh, in the overlap, it's always the, the harder jet that basically eats up the overlap, right? Because in the distance measure, I had the one over PTI uh, squared. Uh, so the one with the higher energy or higher PT has the smaller distance. Therefore, whatever is in the overlap uh, tends to go to the more high energetic jet. Uh, and it's quite ironic, right? Because the, the reason why people insisted on continuing using cones is because they, they wanted cone shapes, uh, cone shaped um, object at the end of the day. Uh, and it turns out that the, or the nearly perfect cones are actually something that you can get out of a sequential recombination algorithm. Uh, so it's kind of uh, ironic in a sense. Uh, very good. So now that we've uh, seen this, let's uh, study a little bit on, uh, on what are our choices and uh, how, how we should make them. Right? Uh, so the main choice uh, or the main parameter that we have in all these cone algorithms is the cone size, R. Uh, and it strongly impacts the radiation loss as well as the contamination. So this is a picture I copied from my first lecture where I tried to highlight that uh, it, it's very difficult to find something like a best jet algorithm because there are, there are various aspects that kind of uh, play against each other. So let's try to study the impact of, of this R uh, on, on emissions. Uh, so uh, for this, we, we look at the energy of a jet and, and uh, ask ourselves how emissions uh, uh, change this picture. Uh, so at leading order, uh, nothing happens. So the energy of the jet is just EJ, the initial uh, jet of my quark. Uh, at next to leading order, uh, I can have an emission as sketched here. And uh, here I will uh, need the, uh, I cannot work in the soft end collinear. So I will take the formula that we've derived uh, uh, in the last lecture for the collinear limit, which is alpha s over pi, d theta over theta, splitting functions, uh, times uh, dz. And the uh, virtual corrections, uh, again, as I uh, showed in the very end of the last lecture, uh, we can incorporate just by uh, unitarity. So it's basically just minus the, the real emission uh, integrated inclusively. Uh, so let's, let's see then what happens uh, uh, to this uh, jet energy uh, at order alpha x. And so we're saying that the emission probability is alpha s um, over pi. I'll have to integrate over d theta over theta. 
and uh, the splitting function pg qz dz. Let me open a big bracket. And let's look at the different kind of uh, configurations we can have. Now, we, we can have the situation where I have a gluon emission that has an angle theta that is smaller than r. Uh, if it's smaller than r, it's clustered into the same jet. So the energy of the jet does not change. It's just Ej. Uh, let me switch back to color. The energy is just Ej uh, in the case that the emission happens inside the jet, which is smaller than r. Very good. Uh, now, what happens if the emission happens uh, outside of the jet? So theta bigger than r. Uh, then I have this momentum splitting that happened uh, where the uh, energy of, uh, of the quark carries one minus z of the energy of the initiating jet. And the gluon takes away the energy fraction z of the uh, original quark. Uh, so for theta bigger than one, uh, I lose energy. I only have one minus z times ej. However, I have to ask myself one question, which of the two jets, uh, which of the jets I'm picking, right? Because if the emission happens outside of the cone, uh, I have produced two different jets. And then the question becomes, which of the two should I pick? Uh, and um, a very natural choice is to say that the jet with the higher energy is the one that I'm interested in. Uh, in which case, uh, I'm only interested in this uh, in this quark guy if uh, z is smaller than one half, because then it's the quark that is carrying more of the energy. So we have z smaller than one half. Uh, in the case uh, that is larger than one half, I'm interested actually in the in the other one in the in the blue object. Uh, in which case, it's z times energy of the z radiation outside of the cone that bigger than one half. Very good. Uh, so those were all the real type corrections, uh, but we also have the, the virtual corrections that we need to include. And as I said, this is just minus the, the real emission corrections uh, and the energy of the jet does not change, right? Uh, so it's minus uh, energy of the jet without any constraints on emissions because there, there is no kinematics attached to this contribution. Uh, so that's it. Uh, what we see is that if we combine this term together with this, uh, it just becomes minus Ej theta outside of R, right? So everything uh, is proportional to emission outside of the jet. So what do we get? Okay, so the pi. It's all confined to emission outside of the jet. So the lower bound is theta, uh, sorry, r, uh, d theta over theta, uh, p, g, q of z, dz. Uh, let's also pull out the energy. Uh, and then uh, inside the bracket, I have, uh, one minus z, right, uh, I should also uh, sprinkle in a one here. The uh, one is theta z smaller one half plus theta z larger one half. So I distribute the virtual corrections to, do, to these two terms. Uh, so in total, I get one minus z um, uh, one minus z minus one, uh, which is minus z theta z smaller one half. Uh, and in the other case, I get z minus one, so minus one minus z theta. So larger than one half. 
uh, I can perform the integration in theta. Uh, let's do that. Dj alpha s over pi. The theta integration gives me a log of one over r. So this upper bound, I, I picked one, uh, but it doesn't really matter uh, because I'm only interested in the in the dependence on the lower uh, lower boundary, uh, which gives me the one over r dependence uh, inside the log. And then uh, what is left over is I have minus uh, integral of zero to one half uh, dz z times the pgq of z minus the integral of one half to one dz one minus z times p g q let's put this one here g q of z okay um and here you can now plug in if you want uh the splitting function, which is CF uh, one plus one minus Z squared over Z. And what is uh, worthwhile noting is that the singularity that I have here, the one over Z, which is associated with the soft singularity, that this actually is regulated or canceled by the Z factor that I got, right? Um, so by including the uh, the virtual correction, uh, as I would expect, uh, the, the singular behavior is, is gone. Uh, and you can perform this integration if you want. Um, numerically, what you get out here is, uh, well, you first of all, get a CF uh, from the um, splitting function, uh, and the rest is uh, in, uh, one point uh, something. It's very close to one. Uh, okay, uh, actually, I can just give you the result here. There we go. Uh, so what we see is that at next to leading order, the energy of the jet, uh, first of all, gets a negative correction, which is quite uh, uh, intuitive or what you would expect, uh, given that I'm talking about uh, if the emission happens inside the cone, I recombine it so nothing happens. It's only the emission that go outside of my cone. Uh, in which case I lose energy, so that should be negative. Uh, I get a dependence that uh, is logarithmic in one over r, uh, so this becomes larger as I take the cone smaller and smaller, because I let uh, I I lose more and more emissions the smaller I make the cone, uh, and it uh, gets a factor uh, which, in the case of the quark, is proportional to CF times order one, uh, and in the case of a gluon, if you would repeat the whole exercise, uh, it's it's. Uh, CA times uh, something order one, right? Uh, for a typical cone size, this amounts to something like minus 5% in the case of quarks and minus 10% in the case of uh, gluons. Uh, so this is what I put now here in this entry. This is what we've computed. In the case of initial state radiation, uh, you're also uh, proportional to the hard, uh, hard scale in a way, right? Proportional to PT. Uh, but there is no real uh, angular enhancement that you can expect there, right? Because this is just, uh, 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 there's no enhancement for this kind of emission of initial state radiation that just by accident uh, happens to end up in my cone. Uh, so it's just proportional to the area of my uh, jet, which is just R squared. Uh, similarly for MPI or uh, underlying event, uh, these uh, are also just proportional to uh, to the jet area. Uh, and here I'm giving you some typical values. And in the case of hadronization, uh, it's again a loss. Uh, the scale is lambda QCD as you would expect. Uh, and the way the loss happens is, is uh, something like one over R. So you have like all these effects playing with each other. Uh, and then uh, what you would like to do is you want to kind of optimize the choice of R in order to make the, the fluctuations in a way or the, the, the errors uh, that, that accumulate inside your jet uh, as small as possible, right? Uh, so this is what you see here. Uh, so you try to somehow uh, reduce the, the variance in, in the PT uh, by choosing a, a good cone size. Uh, and then here at the left-hand plot, uh, you see a quark jet uh, at a transverse energy of, of 50 GV, right? 
And then you see a little bit of a breakdown, uh, which is not 100% the same kind of notation I had. Uh, so this blue batch, this is the one that I called FSR. You see, as I choose R smaller, uh, the bigger the FSR effects become because it goes like log one over R. So it becomes big. And uh, you also see the hadronization, which becomes bigger as you go to smaller cone sizes. This is the, the minus one over R behavior. Uh, and as you go to larger cone sizes, you, you collect up more and more junk uh, here uh, as written as underlying event. Uh, and if you just look at the variation, you see there, there's a minimum, which is the, the one where you have the least sensitivity in a way uh, coming from the different type of contributions. Uh, so something around 0.4, 0.5, uh, uh, this uh, uh, cone size uh, is quite uh, good in order to uh, reduce the impact from underlying event. Uh, if you move on to a much more high energetic jet, uh, so something that uh, is at one TV, uh, then uh, you see, given that the FSR scales like the PT of the jet, uh, that this contribution just becomes very big, right? Uh, and given that uh, this is the dominant contribution, you would like to choose the cone size as large as possible, so you catch uh, catch back uh, or, uh, as much as possible from these final state emissions. Uh, uh, so. Uh, at very large, uh, in order to obtain uh, FSR, one of the optimal choice is more like a cone size of one. So as I said, uh, uh, the choice of cone and uh, jet settings are, are dependent on, on the kind of applications you envision for your, for your physics. Um, yeah, I think the time has run out, um, but let me just flash one thing. Uh, with which people can also play if they wish to do so. Um, I guess I will have to unshare my screen real quick. And let's see if I can pick out the, the proper window that I wanted. There we go. Um, so, what you see here. Uh, this is a website, so you can go on this yourself uh, and, and play with this. It's called this Jet Quality website in, in Devon Salam space. And uh, here you can look at, um, uh, play around actually with, uh, with some events that are generated uh, using Pythia. If I'm, I'm mistaken, Pythia. Uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, here on the left, let's try out QQBar. Events. So some imagine we, we look at the uh, uh, Z boson. So let's make this the mass something around 100. Okay. So imagine this is a Z boson decaying into a QQ bar pair. Uh, let's use anti KT to recon, uh, recluster it. And now you can play around with the cone size and see how, how the reconstructed dijet mass uh, behaves, right? And you see when I choose a small cone size, uh, I put in something like 100, but it peaks more around uh, slightly smaller values. This is because uh, of FSR that I lose energy and therefore the reconstructed mass will be smaller. Uh, and I can capture it by increasing the cone size more and more. Uh, however, as I increase it, also my, uh, my uh, resonance in a way washes out because I collect more and more uh, junk in the event, right, unfortunately. Uh, and in this blue area, you see like a quality measure, which tells you uh, where the majority of the events, uh, or what is the smallest window in the Dijit in Vermont that you can find that captures a certain fraction of the events. So you want to make this quality measure, this Q, uh, as small as you can. Oh, sorry, as small as you can. Uh, so it's 10, 8, 7, then it increases again. So here in this case, something around 7.7 uh, is the smallest I can get. So the cone size of 0.5 is like a, a decent choice. Uh, you can now look at what happens if you include pile up. You see that the peak moves to the right and becomes uh, wider uh, and even more wider as you increase more pile up, right? 
And uh, here on the right, we can, for instance, imagine something like a hex decaying to blue blue uh, at an invariant mass of 2 TB or something. Yeah, so imagine uh, some scalar, new scalar particle that you want to find. Uh, and similarly here, you, you see, uh, you can play around a little bit and, and see how the reconstruction works. Uh, okay, so I think my time is uh, over. So let me uh, stop here. And in the next lecture, uh, we will look at uh, jet substructure uh, and the, the, um, the resummation of uh, an observable called the uh, jet invariant mass. Uh, so thank you for attention.